thank you, Eric and um, uh, Robert, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me. It's very exciting to be here. I don't very often get the opportunity to talk in a non-academic environment like this. So I'm really looking forward to, to meeting you in the, in the breaks and talk more to you about it. So my goal with this talk is, is um, to tell you a little bit about the experiments and the um, test beds that we're working on. And my hope is that after the talk, you will be, at least be able to kind of understand what the title of my talk means. So that's sort of the, the, the main goal. Uh, the work I'm presenting is actually been carried out over several years. And here I list some of the collaborators, especially at KTH, where I'm working, and the Circus project, which I will mention more briefly at the end. Uh, also, my former student, Andre Texera, who is in Delft University. Uh, and also Professor Alvaro Cardenas in, in Texas. And finally, the test bed I will mention at the end, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a project called Sparks. It's an EU project, and it's collaboration with AIT in Vienna and EMC Corporation and UTRC in Ireland. So these are all lots of people involved in this, in this work I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let's move on. So uh, I think this is a picture you have seen more or less before, and it's like an IT perspective of the industrial control systems that we're concerned about. So, of course, in the bottom, we have the physical infrastructure that we're interested in. And in my case, it has often been a microgrid, a power grid, or it can be a district heating system. It's some sort of physical infrastructure. And above that, we have some local controllers, PLCs, RTU, that are running. And above that, of course, we have the control network, a SCADA network, a control center, and above that, we have the the, the corporate network, a business layer, so to say. And cyber attacks now can, of course, occur in different levels. It can occur down, you can infect PLCs, like the Stuxnet attack that you've probably heard about, but it could also be corruptions higher up in the networks. So somehow, that's, on a high level, this is how, how we, we, we can think about cyber attacks in, in industrial control systems. Uh, now, my background is in the control engineering or control theory, and we typically do not use this type of diagram to, to model a control system. We rather use a more abstract view, and I'd like to present that to you. It's what we call a block diagram. It's essentially saying the same thing, but it visualizes in a different way, and it portrays where the attacker enters in a slightly different way. So let, me, let us work, work our way through this loop here and try to understand what is happening. So it's a feedback loop. It's a feedback controller. So the physical infrastructure, the physical here, it's, it's this block here in the middle. And here we have an, a signal. It's just the control. So it could be the power injection to a power grid. And Z here, it's what we measure, the physical property we're, we care about. It could be the voltage or the uh, power generation, for instance. So that is the physics, so to say. The, the actual physical control and Z is the, what the real physical system. This is what we really care about. This is what we would like to behave well. But to make sure it behaves, we have now all this other equipment and IT infrastructure. Particularly, we have the sensors, which then, of course, measure some of the properties and sends it to a controller. So the controller could, be, for instance, be now the PLC, but it could also be up here in the operator workstation. So this loop here could be either down here or it could be going across several layers. But it's the same picture applies. So we have a controller which computes then what is the correct action. If I would like to control my physical process, what should I do? And it's computes a signal U, and it's sent to the actuators, which then actually implements, it could be a power generator, for instance, which actually puts in the, the, the power. So what can now the attacker do in, in, in this, this, this way to visualize the system? So for instance, an attacker could corrupt actuators. What would that mean? It would mean that my controller says that you should inject uh, 50 kilowatts. But if the actuator is corrupted, it may mean that it actually will not satisfy. It will not do that. It will do something else. For instance, it will inject, inject 60 kilowatts. That would a typical example of what that bad guy. If there's a bad guy in the sensor, it could do, uh, it will corrupt the measurements. So if I measure 50 kilowatts, what will actually reach the controller could be 
40. It's a, it's a corruption. And finally, the bad guy here in the controller would mean that the controller, the um, implementation has been corrupted. It will not do what I, what I expect. So that's kind of one way to, 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 to visualize a control system, and that's often how we do it in academia. Now, in my title, I had the word physical anomaly detection. So what is that? Well, it's this block here. So what this is, is actually um, a block that uses that we actually know something about the physical process we're controlling. Um, presumably at least, right? Because you have designed a control system to, to make it behave in a good way. So the detector here has a model. It should have a model of the physical process. So for instance, it could be a, a physical model of the electrical network, or in a district heating system we'll talk later about, it could be a model of how the water will flow and how the temperature depends on each other in different measuring points. And what this detector does now is that it collects the commands that the controller would like to send, and it collects the measurements you get. And then it makes sure here, it checks basically, are the, these measurements consistent with what, what it should be? And if it does not do that, there will be an alarm or an alert that could potentially lead to a reconfiguration. So this is what I mean by a, an anomaly detector. And the good thing with such a device is that it doesn't, if there is an attack now in the sensor, it doesn't really matter how the sensor was corrupted, if it was uh, an intrusion in the communication or if the sensor device broke. Or What this device does is checks, does my system follow the laws that I expect it to follow? And if not, it will tell me. And presumably, it can also help me to identify what the problem is. So that's kind of the, the idea of, of a physics-based anomaly detector. I will tell you a little bit more about how we design these and how we uh, try to understand how, how well they work in the following slides. So here is an example that we're using in our lab. So it's a, it's a water tank process. And if, if you like, you can think about this as a simple model of a, a, a process control network. So we have four water tanks connected like this. Um, and there's two pumps, one pump here and one pump here. So if this pump injects some water, some of the, there's a valve here, so some of the water will go down here and some will go up to that tank. And there is another pump here which will pump in water there and some water will go in there. And then we have two measurements. We measure this water level and we measure this water level here. Uh, those measurements are being transmitted wirelessly in this case. We have wireless measurements. They're being transmitted to a controller which then decides how much water should I pump in in order to control these water, the lower water tanks. So I only measure the local one, the, the lower ones. You can think of the upper ones as some sort of buffer tanks that I, of course, they should be operational, but I don't really measure them. I just expect them to, to behave well. So that's the um, uh, a tip, a simple control system. Now we will look at a particular attack now where an attacker, in the middle here, it's, uh, there's a hacked repeater which will corrupt the controls. So the controller will work fine, it will receive all the measurements correctly, but it will not, when it receives the measurements, and the controls, it will not implement them. It will actually apply something different. And we'll think a little bit about when it is possible for the detector to, to, to see if something is going on, going, going well or not. And for this I will ha I have a little video clip from our lab to show, and there will be a guy starting a corruption. So that's basically this hacked repeater that you see here. So let's look at it. It's not... So here the attacker starts. And what you see here to the left are the water levels. You can see the water levels here. So those are steady. They should be steady all the time. Now the attack started. What the attacker do now is he, instead of implementing the controls you should, he starts to exponentially increase one pump and exponentially decrease the other pump. So if you look carefully, what happened now is that the, the, those water levels below, they stay steady, so they're fine. So from the control system's perspective, the system looks perfectly fine. But the attacker corrupted simultaneously the controls in a way that one buffer tank emptied and the other one went up. So what I'm showing here is that 
a smart attacker, so this was not just any attack, this corruption here is a very specifically designed by a person who actually know how this system works. So my question here is, is it always possible to, do, to detect attacks in a system like this? The answer is no, not against an adversary who knows the physics. So this physics, it, it can work both ways. I can use it to detect that it's not behaving, but on the other hand, if I have a powerful attacker who actually knows how the system is rigged, he, in this case, can actually corrupt the controls to make it undetectable. So there's this, this two ways here. But you have to understand, this is a very powerful attacker. It's an attacker who actually knows very well how the system works, and he basically can stage an attack that is invisible to the control system, at least for, for a while. So, um, to just sum up the possibilities with this detection system is that these are very powerful for detecting randomly failing components. If one of the actuators break or if it just starts to not apply what it should, then this detector will, will find it. Same way, if there's a cyber attacker that corrupts measurements or controls, but he doesn't really know the physics here, he will also be detected. So for instance, if the attacker had not corrupted the measurements in this exact way, it would have been detected. So he has to really, really know what he's doing here to be undetected. You can see here that nothing happened to the measurements. If he had just done slightly different manipulations here, it would have been seen here and the detector would have discovered this. So, these are all good news for security and, sa uh, and safety, but as the example shows that if I have an attacker with process knowledge and an ability to make a coordinated attack, so why is it coordinated? Well, it's coordinated because he had to attack both actuators simultaneously and one has to increase and one has to decrease in a very special way, otherwise it will be detected. So it's a very advanced attacker in a sense. So this is all, uh, sounds like it's very yes and no, but of course there's a big gray zone here. And we've, lately we've been working about, about how to try to quantify this for particular systems. How can we see how safe such a detection system is? And we have proposed recently uh, one way, it's a, um, a trade-off curve. So on, on, on this axis here, on the left, the y-axis, we basically measure what is the damage, a powerful attacker like this, what is the damage to the system he can do? So for instance, how much damage this buffer tank that emptied, how bad is that? That impact you have on the y-axis. On the x-axis we have the false alarm rate. So every uh, detecting system like this, it will always now and then deliver a false alarm. So even if the system is not faulty, there's no attack, every now and then there will be false alarms. And that depends on how sensitive I make this detector. So on the x-axis I basically say how sensitive is my detector and we plot that against the impact of the, such an, an advanced attacker. And now we can compute such curve for every possible detector that we consider. And of course the lower curve is the better because it means that for the same false alarm rate, I get a smaller worst case impact. So for instance, here's a power system example we've been working on lately, and we considered three different types of detection systems, and in this case, the lower one here, which was a QSUM detector with a certain threshold policy, is the smallest one. So that, this is then the right uh, detection strategy. So this is one of, our, one of my students is working on right now, is basically to take systems like for instance, the water tank system and power grid, and come up with um, software to compute these type of curves, and they can then help you to design the triggering rules. You can decide whether, how, how good the model is of, of your physical process and how important that will be for the impact. So it will guide you in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this process. Um, so in my... Final, so basically what I'm trying to tell you now is a little bit about the uh, limitations and the um, possibilities of this detection box here. So what I want to talk about now a little bit, my, my final slides here, is a little bit, okay, let's say now that we have detected. Let's say now that the attacker has been detected. So for instance, in the water tank system, assume the attacker wasn't so smart. He actually only corrupted one of the actuators and that is detectable. What can I do in real time? I would like to keep my control system running. I don't want to shut it down. Basically what I'm asking is can I do something here in the reconfiguration online in real time and still keep the system up? 
So I'll show you now the example now from the EU project we're working on, and it's a, it's a microgrid. It's a test bed in, in Ireland, in Cork. It's a, it's a university campus where they have a microgrid. There's a wind turbine, there's a battery, and there's a combined heat and power plant. This is this one here, it's 50 kilowatts. And that is the, uh, will be the target of, of, uh, of this attack I'm going to talk about. I'm mainly going to talk about the thermal side of this. So basically what we have here is um, we have a boiler and we have a combined heat and power system. It boils water and it pumps out the water in the header flow out into the buildings of the campus and colder water comes back. Now what we identified here or the, the, the people running this as a critical control loop is actually the, the controller that measures the header flow, the temperature of the water going out and the water temperature of the water going coming back, because that controls when the boiler should go on and off. So if that control loop starts to misbehave, it can damage the uh, combined heat and power plant, and that's considered that particularly bad. So the attacker here is, we assume that somehow they have in, attacked the sensors, uh, so it corrupts the measurements of this, um, this local, it's this PLC that controls the temperature, in order to make the boiler to, to run in a, in a, bad, in a, in a bad, uh, bad, bad behavior and damage it. Now, what we're going to use now is basically to assume that we actually have, uh, assume that we have a physical model, because we have lots of other measurements in the grid, right? It's the same water, it's a closed physical system. The water that I boil here, it goes out into the buildings and I can measure temperatures throughout the system. So basically what this means is that if I have an understanding of the physics here, if I measure the temperature here, I could actually estimate what the temperature should be in the boiler, right? There, there is the same water, it cannot just change arbitrarily, because if it does, then it means that there's something wrong here. So what we're going to do now as a defender is we're going to collect measurements in the control center, we're going to check, does this actually make sense? Does the measurements in the boiler controller actually fit to the temperatures we have in, in the system. And if not, we're going to alarm, and then we can use that to actually correct a measurement here. So the defender here is going to use that we have a physical model here, and actually we, we estimated it as a model. We collected data, and we just estimated a physical model from the grid. Uh, and then we implemented a strategy. I will very quickly run through how it works. In the middle here, this is a control loop that shows how, how the measurements are being corrupted for the boiler. The measurements for the uh, rooms are not being corrupted. We collect all the data in the control center. We run the anomaly detector. So stage one is basically to check, does the data, is it consistent? If not, we identify the, the, uh, that the boiler measurement is not okay. Then we use the physical model in a second stage to estimate what, what should it be. Given all the other measurements we have in the system which are not attacked, what should the, the, the temperature be? And then we actually feed that back to the inner controller. This, of course, means that the control loop we used to have here was not as... It will be much slower because we're, we're closing the control loop over the control center. But on the other hand, the system is at least not using corrupted malicious data. So at least it's better than running it in that state. And here's just to show you some, some, um, some simulations of the system we've done. So this is the temperature of the header flow and, and uh, header return. So the temperature oscillates. It's a, it's a thermostat turning the heater on and off. And at time 3000, there's this corruption. So basically the, the temperature drops. So the attacker fools the control system to pull down the temperature. So this is damaging. Uh, the anomaly detector will de find it after 1,400 seconds and then starts to estimate what the temperature should be. And as you can see here, we can then drive back the, 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 the actual temperature. So basically, we, re we detected the attack and recovered the system to, to, the, to, the, um, to, the, to the correct state. So just to summarize, uh, I, I, I hope at least you have got a sense about what I mean by a physics-based anomaly detector. And it's good, I'd say, for safety in the sense that it can find randomly failing components if you have this model. Uh, also, an attacker that doesn't really know so much about the, uh, the physical infrastructure, he is also very likely to get caught by this. But as, as the movie showed, 
an advanced attacker who knows a lot, he can, given certain resources, he can corrupt the system and still be undetectable. And to try to understand a little bit the gray zones here and quantify these sensitivities, we have this, um, this uh, metrics, that I, these curves I try to, so basically false alarms versus uh, attack impact. Um, and then finally, I showed you now how you can try to integrate these ideas in, in an actual control system and how you can use um, the control center, all the information that you sit on in the control center, to try to use that in real time to at least increase the tolerance of the system to these type of attacks. Uh, I'd also like to, to mention this uh, Circus Center that I mentioned in the beginning. It, it's, it's, um, it's a center sponsored by MSB and um, it's at KTH and we are four groups here. So we basically look at ICS in this way and we are four different areas. We have one group working on embedded controllers led by Mats Dam. We have one group focusing on the wireless infrastructure, if you have wireless components in these systems, by, led by Ragnar Tobaben. We have one group focusing on the, um, the SCADA communications, and that's led by George Dunn. And then finally, it's me, who, who is the control guy. I, I look more on these, uh, the control uh, architectures. Uh, so if you're interested in this project, I, I invite you to, to check out our, our website. Um, and this Sparks project, this is where we, this microgrid that I mentioned, um, uh, you can look at this, the project website there. And finally, if you want to reach me somehow, or you, you, you're welcome to, to check out my, my website where it's more publications if you want to look up the, for, for the details. Uh, and by that, I am done. So, thank you. So, in this session, we have the speakers stay on stage. So, please take that, this chair to the, to the left. And we will now 